Miss Livia Firth. And for years now, I've been fighting for a more just and sustainable future for fashion. Lately, whenever activists or environmentalists point to the ecological nightmare that is the modern day fashion industry, brands respond by telling us not to worry. We are told there is no need to slow down our runway consumption. This story, hugely financed and largely unchallenged, gives brands permission to continue producing more than 100 billion garments every year, most of them cheaply made and quickly thrown away. Meanwhile, the stakes could not be higher, as we face the alarming effects of climate change, growing impacts to ecosystems and the world's most vulnerable people. So I gathered some of the brightest visionaries I know for a conversation about how we can bypass the lies, transform the way we make clothes, and begin to build the truly circular economies. Lucy, what has been your personal journey into circularity? I started thinking, well, what kind of volume of resources are we using? And I found that we use nearly 100 billion tons of the Earth's resources each year. And almost all of that ends up as pollution. So we pushed ourselves largely through this take, make and waste system into a very, very risky situation where, to be honest, our continued survival, there's a question mark over it. I've always been really interested in design, so that made me think, well, could we design things better? And the answer is yes, because circular thinking is really just kind of smart, strategic use of resources. While circular thinking presents us with the potential for a real revolution, a growing number of us see it being exaggerated in its current form by brands intent on marketing through the language of sustainability while maintaining business as usual. Brands promise recycling, take back programs and circularity with no real transparency around what these words really mean. What do you think when you hear the, the term circular economy? When I hear it in the context of the apparel sector, I hear permission to shop. I hear, don't worry, uh, you can buy this because we are either going to recycle the fiber or we're going to provide a resale site that you can sell it on or we personally are going to collect it and it is somehow going to go to all these uh, poor and needy people who are going to use it. I don't see any, any real circularity in the apparel sector. I see uh, permission to shop. For years, one of the significant problems facing an increasingly disposable model of making clothes has been the staggering waste, filling landfills around the world. The Cantamanto market is one of many places where used clothing is sold to local merchants and where the industry insists that what was traditionally trash is getting another life. Here in Cantamanto, some 15 million garments are delivered every week to a country with a population of just over 30 million people. If you're human and in, you're in this world, you are supposed to be concerned about this issue. But me being a fashion designer and someone who works in fashion, it became like, you know, close to home. It became an issue that is very close to me because it's in a space of something that I love. Cantamento has really shifted. There's less um, quality of clothing and there's like the quantity is just like way overhead. And then what happens in Cantamanto is all of these things come in bills. The bills are opened and most of the time, a higher percentage of it is just not um, saleable because they're not of like, good quality. And what happens there is they are um, menders, they are um, upcyclers, they are people who resize them, like repurpose them into different artifacts altogether. Sami. Does all the clothing that arrive in Cantamanto get um, a second chance, a second life? No, most, most of them don't. And that is because most of the clothing that come in, are coming in are probably worn out in a very poor condition, in very bad quality. The problem is overproduction and overconsuming. Well, I've been really kind of cheered by the fact that circular economy has had a resurgence. I got really, really excited by the prospect that we could switch from a linear economy and linear thinking to circular. And then 
to my horror, I felt like that process got hijacked. One of the central stories the industry continues to tell is the idea that synthetic, man-made plastic fibers are somehow more sustainable than natural fiber, leading to skyrocketing production of polyester. Every single piece of plastic that has ever been produced is still with us, unless it has been incinerated. Polyester is, is it's either natural gas or it's oil. That's its, its, uh, its base material. It became clear to me that a lot of people understood via the term circular economy that plastic was infinitely recyclable. And I just see very little evidence. So nobody actually has any data on which you can make these claims at all, even if you are just looking at the environmental impact. They don't have the data and they want to plug these um, half-baked kind of numbers which they're churning out of the earth. And we don't even know how they made the numbers. Every single index in the sustainable apparel sector, it's pay for play, it's behind a paywall. Um, it's been produced not by leading um, economists and scientists, it's been produced by private companies for private companies. Meanwhile, farmers around the world are rediscovering how to create natural fibers in harmony with the land bringing about healing after years of industrial-style practices. I, I, I had to take over farming when I was 22, when my father got sick. And uh, so I learnt all the traditional industrial practices. And, and then I walked into a five-year drought in the early 1980s. I did great harm to my landscape and had a big debt. And, and that was, if you like, the head-cracking event for me that realised that if we farm differently and started to regenerate our landscape functions, we had the tools in our hands, using our animals, sheep and cattle particularly, to regenerate that landscape and, and in turn to affect a lot of the major issues that our planet now confronts. In our case, virtually no fossil fuel goes into them, no chemical, no industrial fertilisers, no harming of a landscape. So, it is a very green, healthy fibre, in my view. What do you say when, when you hear that the debate today is very much in favour of synthetic fibres being more sustainable and more ecological than um, natural fibre? I'd say it was very good marketing. And um, when you boil it down, whether it's our food industries or the fibre industries, the great power in, in Western, modern, in fact, global society are the giant transnational companies. Uh, of course, you're going to hear that dominant voice saying um, it's the best, but uh, if you then want to cost what we're doing to the global Earth system, we know it, that industrial approach to food and fibre is having devastating consequences. Regenerative agriculture is turning that around, it's healing, it's bringing the the systems back to health. Would fast fashion be able to survive at those volumes, at those costs, if they used only natural fibres? Would they be able to survive? I doubt very much, if you looked at the economics, whether um, fast fashion would survive purely on naturals. I think really synthetics has been one of the major ingredients of the fast fashion revolution. When the industry talks about environmental issues or sustainability, there is often little to no mention of people. Dr. Hakan Karaosman is a social scientist who has spent years investigating the fashion industry, advocating for both people and the planet. We forgot why fashion was born and what fashion was created to do and what is our relationship with fashion. So fashion was created to bring beauty to life, but along the way, the business model became so profit-driven and we forgot the connection between human and fashion. And at this point, fashion, which was a dream, has become a nightmare. Most people um, think of sustainability as an environmental justice only, but there is that social aspect and social justice aspect, which is so important. Sustainability is a very multifaceted conversation. It has so many different dimensions and we cannot cherry pick one dimension and we cannot separate those interlinked facets. Why social sustainability is so important? Because we have so many trade-offs. 
and tensions between environmental and social sustainability. Why people approach environmental sustainability? Because it is much easier to quantify. It is much easier to put indicators and it is much easier to see outcomes in short run. But for social sustainability, the indicators are more complicated and it requires a holistic change. Because the production of natural fibers is, is so important to some of the poorest people on the planet, if you're going to start including the social economic impact, then you are clearly not going to come out with an answer that says that plastic fibers are more sustainable. So if you want to have the narrative that plastic fibers are more sustainable, you do not want to look at the socioeconomic impact of what you're doing at all. So they don't. Plastic is a material where you can find a problem at every single stage of its life cycle. Like there's no point when you can give up worrying about plastic. <laughs> we have other materials where you don't have to worry the entire way through. You know, and that's a real marker of a material that's got more circularity capability, that could do something in a closed loop environment. That's, it's more robust, it's more resilient, and it's got something um, that means it can mirror nature rather than working against it. Our aim to be fully circular is because we believe there's no future business without being circular. I believe capitalism will totally fail if circularity doesn't really happen at some point. As we begin the hard work of rewriting the story of true circularity, one of the most inspiring tools we have is the powerful proof of what is possible when a business makes sustainability central to its creativity and innovation. This is the way we're engineering our new fabrics. We want to make sure that every new fabric we create could be uh, biodegradable and compostable so that at the end of its life, uh, it could be returned to nature as a biofertilizer, uh, which can be uh, addressed to cotton fields to grow the cotton again. And, and we're working with um, better ingredients, natural ingredients and smart ingredients in order to make this happen together with major investments in new technologies. We just came up with our biggest innovation. Uh, it is the world's first uh, biodegradable uh, elastic denim. So we are replacing uh, common synthetic elastomers uh, with the bio-based and biodegradable um, material that comes from natural rubber and, and actually doesn't interfere biodegradability, actually facilitates biodegradability and even compostability. And we're not compromising any of the performance or the aesthetics. What we've, what we've shifted from that organic mind of the, of, the, of the indigenous and people to the mechanical mind, where nature has no part, and in the modern system now, nature is seen there to exploit for profits, irrespective of the consequences. We should use the best of both those worlds, the organic mind, which is this absolute uh, respect and love for nature, with the best of modern science, to take us to sort of that combined, a newer type of mind. As wonderful as it was, the scientific revolution, etc., to the stage that we've now become divorced from Mother Earth. Essentially, we're at a crossroads, aren't we? We can either use Earth logic, we can aggregate all the stuff that we've learned about the planet and how it actually works, and we can drive towards real uh, carbon goals, the Paris Agreement, which means that our children, our grandchildren, the future can continue to have an active and productive life on this planet. Now, I would argue that is an amazing prize and it's not one that I am willing to give up because somebody was overclaiming, greenwashing, didn't want to stop producing millions of stupid polyester garments, synthetic garments that nobody really wanted. The promise of a circular economy is in the complete reimagining of a world where creativity and destruction must no longer go hand in hand an invitation to rewrite a story big enough and bold enough to include all of us working to make a life here on this one planet we call home. May we all take inspiration from those working to create this new and needed future. May we remember that well-financed lies, even those dressed up in cheap clothes, are still merely lies.
and may we dedicate ourselves to the unwavering belief that fashion can and must become a source of beauty, hope, and healing here in our time. There's so much calculated misinformation taking place in this industry. And if we trace all of these evidence, circularity to me is a great vision for which we need strategies. Circular economy cannot be realized if we don't ensure representation and inclusion. What would you say to, to a fast fashion CEO if she or him came to Cantamanto? I've actually thought of that before. But if, if I was ever going to have the opportunity to meet any of these people and talk to them face to face, it was just for me to ask them why they're killing the world. That would be the first question, why they are comfortably killing the world. This issue is not an issue that affects one person. I mean, it could be something that's happening here in Accra in Ghana, but then it's an entire ecosystem. So the one question that I, I, I would want to ask them is why they are comfortably killing the world.